Yeah, it's around 4.30 and let's start, sir. Uh, let me formally welcome you for this, uh, for the lecture which you're delivering at uh, IBS uh, uh, called the Reflections of Financial Management. Uh, uh, we <coughs> having our faculty as well as students who are taking the, this financial management to course. And I'm sure that, you know, they'll be more than happy listening to you. Uh, so let me give you a context. Uh, so around a year or a half back, you know, we had met uh, President Chandra, sir, for a brief interaction. The reason being that, you know, we, we as at IBS and Equi, we take a lot of feedback on the course uh, from the industry and uh, eminent academicians like sir at regular intervals of time. So at this point of time, you know, I was, uh, you know, I was uh, uh, hearing to sir and sir was, you know, was saying very interestingly on what is it that ails the current uh, students. So some of the things which came up in the discussion were also in terms of uh, you know, the uh, students should have a greater understanding of the history of finance. Uh, they should also look at, uh, you know, things like what are we learning from liberal arts? What are we learning from other subjects? It could be nature. It could also be things like physics, right? So, so what happens in this sense is that, you know, they get a broader perspective. They become more resilient and they know that, you know, <coughs> they are going to a person, a certain crisis now, uh, you know, there were people who had gone through far bigger crisis in the past. And, you know, they had overcome that. So these are, you know, some small uh, suggestions which you had given. And thanks to sir that we have gone ahead and we have launched this course called, uh, you know, Finance, uh, you know, History, Civilization and Society. Another important thing which I was also stressing is that, you know, finance people have a responsibility to the society and see that, you know, uh, you know, that societal angle and sense of responsibility is given to the students. So I thought, you know, these were valuable words uh, shared by uh, Professor Chandra. And another important uh, thing is also there that, you know, we are far too much going a little bit only into the area of finance. You know, perhaps that as, as a student, maybe, you know, I get into a KPO, but as we're moving up, we need to understand the strategic angle, you know, and, and the broader perspective, because in any corporate or any financial institution, it's not that only the finance function works independently without, you know, without the other uh, departments or other functions being there. So I'm sure, you know, sir's lecture today would capture more in terms of where finance can act, uh, you know, add, add strategic value uh, to the entire organization and where perhaps strategy depends on finance, uh, you know, for a, for a, you know, for a success. Uh, welcome, sir, uh, for this lecture. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy uh, uh, to be listening to you. I request Professor Sudesh to first uh, introduce you, sir. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's an... Uh privilege and an honor to introduce uh, Dr. Prasanna Chandra. I know no, nobody would like, you know, I, I don't think anybody would uh, be not knowing Prasanna Chandra, but still, it's my honor to go through your uh, introduction. So please, here it is. Dr. Prasanna Chandra, Director of Center for Financial Management, is an MBA, PhD finance. He has over five decades of teaching experience in postgraduate and executive education programs. He was a professor of finance at Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, for over two decades. And he was a visiting professor of finance at Southern Illinois University, USA, for two years. He was appointed as a member of several committees, including the Capital Issues Advisory Committee, the High Powered Committee on Insurance Sector Reforms, and the SEBI Committee on Derivatives. He has served on the boards of a number of organizations, including Torrent Pharmaceuticals, Power Finance Corporation, UTI IAS, ICFI, SDMI, IMD, IFCI, IM Bangalore, Templeton Mutual Funds, Bangalore Stock Exchange Limited, and Karnataka Soaps and Detergents Limited. He has been a consultant to many organizations, and Dr. Chandra has conducted executive seminars for a number of organizations like TCS, Infosys, Tata Motors. ITC, NIIT, Tata Steel, Microsoft, Wipro, Sastian Communications, BHL, Bharat Shell, ANZ Grandlays, HMT, Canada Bank, YCR Bank, ONGC, Gale, Motorola, and Tata Power. He has published nine other books, uh, and few of them are Financial Management Theory and Practice, uh, Behavioral Finance, Strategic Financial Management, Managing for Value Creation, Projects, Planning, Analysis, Financing, Implementation and Review, Investment Game, Corporate Valuation, Finance Sense, Fundamentals of Financial Management and Valuation of Equity Shares, 
and has authored over 70 articles in professional journals and business periodicals. He has been a Fulbright Scholar and a UNDP Fellow, and he has received several honors, including the Best Teacher Award from the Association of Indian Management Schools. And uh, thanks a lot for providing me this opportunity, sir. And I, I give this dias to you. Please uh, help us in understanding financial management in a better way. Thanks a lot for this opportunity. Thank yeah, you thank for you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so we will have this uh, lecture for around 50 to 50 minutes to an hour. And uh, Professor Satish and Professor Koyan Agnath will take the questions. And uh, we will be, uh, you know, ending uh, this particular important, uh, you know, lecture by 5.50 maximum. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon to all of you. And thanks for your kind introduction. When Dr. Satish asked me to give a talk, I was wondering what should be the thrust of my talk. And then I realized that the best way to address financial management would be to look at my own experiences over a period of time with various companies and how I found various concepts in finance very useful. The basis of this lecture is a survey of the extensive literature on financial management a review of a number of annual reports that I often come across, interviews with a number of CEOs and CFOs, and a journal of my own experiences as a corporate director, consultant, and advisor to companies. What I intend doing during this one hour or less than one hour session is to cover certain key areas of financial management, which I found very relevant. Uh, these are listed here. Some of them are covered in your basic courses in financial management. Some may be covered in elective courses. I wanted to give a holistic view of financial management. So I'll touch briefly on each of these areas and what I have learned from my interaction with practitioners and companies over a period of time. I'll start with a very broad statement. All business activities can be reduced to two functions. Valuation of assets, real or financial, tangible or intangible, management of assets for enhancing value. If you look at the work of any manager, irrespective of what his or her functional area is, he or she is involved in these two activities knowingly or unknowingly. So I say the two most important skills for all managers, irrespective of their professional background are valuation and managing for value creation. Let us look at uh, what is involved in various decisions that are taken in a business. If you look at any decision in any business context, it involves a trade-off between the present and the future. And finance is a language with which we understand this trade-off. And essentially all these decisions involve time, risk, and cash flow. Carefully look at any decision, whether it is a decision to do automation, whether it is a decision to do uh, cloud computing, whether it is a decision to aggressively promote a brand, whether it is a decision to acquire another company. All these decisions involve a trade-off between the present and the future. And to understand this trade-off, we we'll, we'll look at time, risk, and cash flow. These are the central concepts in finance. Here, let us briefly understand the distinction between accounting and finance. Accounting looks at the past. Accounting is more or less certain about what happened. Accounting reviews what has happened in the past. Finance deals with future. Finance is concerned with uncertainty and finance is focused on decision-making. Accounting in a way is backward looking and finance is forward looking, of course, accounting reports are very helpful in financial analysis and decision making. All of us are familiar with the basic uh, DCF uh, equation and this equation captures the three elements that I talked of, cash flow, time and risk. And it has been put very beautifully by Warren Buffett. The value of any stock bond or business today is determined by the cash inflows or outflows discounted at an appropriate discount rate that can be expected to occur during the remaining life of an asset. So every manager needs to understand how value is 
calculated and how value can be created by various decisions that he or she takes. I would like to make a very broad claim. Finance is the most important subject because every business decision involves a twin challenge of valuing something and making a decision based on your valuation. Two, financial management is all about maximizing value. The primary objective of a business is to create long-term economic value in a legal, ethical, socially responsible, and environmentally friendly manner. I emphasize in a legal, ethical, socially responsible, and environmentally friendly manner. If we look at the history of corporate governance in the last few decades, you find that there are two broad approaches the shareholder wealth maximization approach, which was espoused in Anglo-American countries for many decades, and the stakeholder theory which dominated Europe and Japan. In the last 20 years, I find that there is an interesting confluence of these two streams in what may be called enlightened value maximization. I find that the debate between shareholder orientation and stakeholder orientation is somewhat sterile and unproductive because when I look at companies around the world, when I look at my own interactions with various companies, I find that a company cannot create value for shareholders unless it protects the interest of stakeholders. So I argue that a company must focus on enlightened value maximization and there is a symbiotic relationship between shareholders and stakeholders. I have not come across any company which has created long-term economic value for shareholders while shortchanging or hurting the interest of other stakeholders. Likewise, if a company wants to protect and nurture the interest of its stakeholders, it has to create value for shareholders. Here we use a very simple condition: a company should earn a return on invested capital, which is at least equal to weight and average cost of capital, in order to ensure the company does not destroy value for shareholders. Only when a company satisfies that condition can it fulfill the expectations of other stakeholders. Uh, as an annual report of Infosys says, corporate governance is about maximizing shareholder value legally, ethically, and on a sustainable basis while ensuring fairness to every stakeholder, the company, the customers, employees, investors, vendor partners, the government of the land, and the community. If you look at the most admired companies in the world, we have names like Microsoft, Apple, Alphabet, Intel, Berkshire, in the US, TCS, HUL, Infosys, Asian Paints, and HDFC Bank in India. And you find that these are companies which have created considerable long-term economic value while protecting and nurturing the interest of other stakeholders. I often ask, what is the objective of a medical school? The objective of medical school is to promote health. The objective of law school is to promote justice. The objective of business school is to ensure that its products focus on creation of economic value in a legal, ethical, and more important, environmentally sustainable manner. What is value? Value is a function of four factors. If we look carefully, value is a function of invested capital, return on invested capital, growth, and risk. Let me, for the sake of uh, a brief understanding of some of the concepts that we'll use, use a set of uh, financial statements. Here is the balance sheet of a company where equity and debt are employed in equal proportions. Fixed assets are 150, net current assets are 50, and total is 200. And this is a PNL account. Revenues 210, cost 170, PBIT or operating income 40, interest 10, PBT 30, tax nine, profit after tax 21. Now, finance has a language, the key 
concepts in finance are net operating profit after tax. This is not an accounting concept. This is a financial concept. Return on invested capital, weight and average cost of capital, free cash flow, and economic value added. NOPAT is defined as profit before interest in tax multiplied by one minus tax rate. In this case, PBIT is 40, tax rate is 30%, so NOPAT works out to 28. NOPAT can also be expressed in this manner, PAT plus interest multiplied by one minus tax. Return on invested capital is defined as NOPAT divided by invested capital. Invested capital is equity plus debt or fixed assets plus net current assets, which is 200. NOPAT is 28. So return on invested capital is 14%. The weighted average cost of capital this firm is 11%. It is calculated in this manner. The weights of equity and debt are equal 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. I've assumed the cost of equity to be 15%. The pre-tax cost of debt is 10% and the post-tax cost is 7%. So the weight and average cost of capital works out to 11%. Let us assume that this firm is growing at a rate of 10%, which means that its assets should also grow in net terms by 10% every year. Since the asset base is 200 million, net investment required to sustain a 10% growth rate would be 20. And free cash flow is defined as net operating profit after tax minus net investment. NOPAT is 28, net investment is 20, so free cash flow is eight. Free cash flow is a cash flow available for distribution to investors, both equity shareholders and lenders of the firm. Economic value added is NOPAT minus weight and average cost of capital, times invested capital, NOPAT is 28, and WAC is 11%, invested capital is 200, and this is six. Free cash flow is a cash flow available for distribution, and it is defined as net operating profit minus net investment. So free cash flow is NOPAT minus net investment. I'm emphasizing free cash flow because when I look at the history of finance from 1960s onwards, I find that progressively the emphasis has shifted uh, in this manner from revenue to net profits to operating income to EBITDA to operating cash flow to free cash flow. This is a very welcome change, partly under the influence of academic developments and partly on the advice of various consulting firms like McKinsey, America, and Bain. I've had an opportunity to discuss with the consultancy companies in the US over a period of time, and I realized that in practice, these concepts, which essentially originated in academia, have been now widely accepted and applied. And a similar trend is quite visible in India. Let me give you an equation which may be called a Zen of corporate finance. We are all familiar with the Gordon dividend discount model. I've just dropped the subscripts for the sake of simplicity. Uh, the Gordon dividend discount model says price is equal to dividend divided by cost of equity minus growth rate. When we value a firm, we look at a period of five years, which is a planning period, and then impute a terminal value at the end of five years. Sometimes we look at a planning period of 10 years, but we look at a planning period, which is normally five to seven years, sometimes it is 10 years. And the terminal value is calculated as free cash flow, divided by weight average cost of capital minus growth rate. Now, I've done valuation for several companies and I found that the terminal value looms large in the valuation exercise. And if we assume the firm is growing at a constant rate from now onward, 
then this formula applies directly. Otherwise, it is the formula for computing the terminal value, which looms large in any valuation exercise. The free cash flow, which is in the numerator of the right-hand side of the above equation, may be expressed as follows. Free cash flow, as I said, is no bad minus net investment. I uh, express the right-hand side side in this manner, no pad multiplied by one minus net investment divided by no pad. And when I look at what is there within the brackets and look at this ratio net income by no pad and divide both the numerator and the denominator by invested capital, I get net income by invested capital, no pad by invested capital. Net investment by invested capital by definition is the constant growth rate and no bad divided by IC is return on invested capital. So free cash flow can be expressed in this manner. The value is free cash flow divided by VAC minus G. This is the expression for free cash flow and this is the denominator. Now you find that the value of a firm is a function of four variables, invested capital, return on invested capital, growth rate, and weighted average cost of capital. These are four critical variables and they appear in what may be called a Zen of corporate finance. I call it as the Zen of corporate finance. Once you have understood is everything else in corporate finance is perhaps a matter of detail. Modern finance has had a tremendous impact on the business world, and this is very heartening. As I said, I've been looking at corporates from 1970 onwards, and I had an opportunity to serve on boards of companies from early 1980s. Over a period of time, I find that the business world has absorbed imbibed and applied concepts of modern finance compared to their predecessors of 50, 30, or even 20 years. Today, senior executives have a better understanding of how strategies have a bearing on those four factors which ultimately determine the value of a firm. And I find CEOs, irrespective of what their formal training in finance is, have a working understanding of discounted cash flow, return on invested capital, which say also call a return on capital employed, cost of capital and valuation multiples. And this understanding and focus on valuation has led to notable improvements in corporate return. We have to understand the kind of value that companies have generated in the last 20, 30, 40 years. Look at the kind of valuations we see in the US. Apple has a market capitalization of $3 trillion. In India also, we have come a long way. I remember in 1992, uh, Tata Steel was the most valuable company in the country, and it had a market capitalization of barely 7,000 crore rupees. And now Reliance has the highest market capitalization with the market capitalization close to 14 lakh crore. We have come truly a long way and TCS has a market capitalization around 13 lakh crore. All this has happened because of certain favorable developments and partly because leading companies have realized the importance of value creation in a legal, ethical, and socially responsible manner. And as a finance academic, I am truly heartened with these developments. Wherever I had an occasion to discuss with the CEO of a company, I've been emphasizing this. And I'm glad that in some cases, I found them very, very accepting these concepts and ideas. Finance theory has had a significant shape on financial analysis and practice. The these are concepts which are now routinely used, free cash flow or uh, free cash flow to the firm, free cash flow to equity, payback accounting rate of return which dominated in the 70s have now given way to IRR and net present value. Of course, they use a supplementary criteria 
free cash flow is widely used. Concept of weight lab is cost of capital has been accepted. All this was not there in 1970s. When I worked with some companies in 1970s and early 80s, they poo-pooed at the idea of calculating a cost of capital. Today, back is a standard element in any financial calculation. And Cost of equity is calculated routinely using the dividend discount model and the capital asset pricing model. None of these models are flawless, but they are far better than conventional ways of doing things. Let me uh, uh, now move on to a uh, few areas of financial decision making and make some of my observations. I'll talk about the investment decisions, I'll talk about uh, financing and distribution decisions, which are the central decisions covered in finance one and finance two of IBS. I will talk about uh, mergers, acquisitions and restructuring. I'll talk about performance management. I'll talk about corporate risk management. I'll talk about corporate governance because in my own experience, these are very, very critical to long-term growth and prosperity of a firm. Let us now come to how corporates look at major investment decisions. This again, based on my own experiences with companies and the kinds of reports that I have examined. Uh, usually an important investment decision is supported by some strategic story. And then they look at the various risks that are involved invariably DCF calculation is done. A careful look at the manner in which financing would be done is undertaken. And it was a surprise to me that earnings per share, which is not an important variable in financial economics, still looms large in practice. So they do look at the impact of a major decision on EPS because Managements often have a short-term orientation as well. In India, it is not so strong, but when I look at uh, companies in the US, I find that they have a very sharp focus on the impact of any decision on short-term behavior of EPS. I consider many Indian companies to be far more uh, futuristic in their orientation compared to their American counterparts. And finally, companies uh, look at the real options embedded in projects. The importance of real options has been realized in the last 10, 15 years. Even companies in India are now looking at it carefully. And they ask these two questions, what is this uncertainty in the environment and what is the flexibility available for management to respond to these uncertainties? And some kind of an option value is imputed. If I look carefully at what is done in practice, I find that a simple matrix like this is rooted in black shows option pricing model. If you have greater environmental uncertainty, you have a higher value for options that you can exercise going forward. Now, interestingly, capital asset pricing model has become the dominant uh, model for calculating cost of equity. We know in academic finance that the uh, capital asset pricing model has been severely criticized, but capital asset pricing model continues to be the dominant paradigm in calculating cost of equity. And when I asked practitioners, they came up various various reasons. Here's a quick recap. Beta can be estimated with short data. Risk free rate can be easily established. Market risk premium can be computed. Theoretically, it is very elegant. The distinction between unique risk and systematic risk is intuitively appealing and there is lesser room for judgment. So it will continue to be the dominant model in practice. Of course, a lot of misallocation of capital has occurred in India and elsewhere. Here are some examples of capital misallocation. 
over a period of time, companies are becoming better in allocating capital. But I must emphasize that rational capital allocation is perhaps the most important skill that any manager would require. Today, we have to make huge investments in intangible assets. And I'm glad that corporate India has now realized the importance of making investments in R&D, market development, automation, data analytics, so on and so forth, which was not there 10, 15, 20 years ago. If I look at a company which is the role model for efficiency in capital allocation, uh, my first choice would be Berkshire Hathaway, which follows a double barrel approach to capital allocation. Uh, Warren Buffett and his partner, Charlie Munger, always go by the discipline of the capital market. They look at opportunities in the capital market and they look at opportunities for acquiring companies. If you look at how Berkshire Hathaway has grown over a period of time, they have a large portfolio of financial securities, largely equity securities, where they have 5, 10, 15 percent holding in a number of leading companies in addition. And now that has become the main business. They have a number of operating companies in which they have a stake of 80 to 100 percent. So they have to constantly evaluate acquisitions vis a vis investments in financial markets. And uh, 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 they have edge over capital allocators who stick to a single course, as Warren Buffett puts it very humorously. Woody Allen explained why eclecticism works. The real advantage of being bisexual is that it doubles your chances of a date on a Saturday night. There are four broad facets of financing and distribution decisions, capital structure, instruments of financing, methods, markets, pricing, timing, distribution policy. You find that companies now have tremendous latitude in almost all of these areas. A company can choose a capital structure it likes. It has a range of financing instruments available. The choice was very, very limited before liberalization. Uh, having served on the Capital Issues Advisory Committee, I realize how limited the choices were in those days, but today uh, they have considerable choices and that is reflected in the innovative financing that companies are using, that is reflected in a variety of methods they employ, markets they tap, and the freedom they have with respect to pricing and timing. Even distribution policy is now being examined very, very carefully. Uh, smart investment decisions create more value than financing decisions. Financing decisions take place in capital markets which are approximately perfect, while financial decisions make, when you make financial decisions, you can observe value of similar financial assets. Uh, there are few opportunities in the realm of financing where NPV is significantly different from zero. How, however, as far as the investment decisions are concerned, they take place in the real markets where imperfections are many. And there are many opportunities to create value as well as destroy value. Uh, these are some of the tools and uh, you find a lot of variations in instruments, Time permitting, I'll come back to them, but uh, the key guidelines that uh, need to be followed when making financing decisions are maintain flexibility, make sure that you have reserve borrowing power to cope with any unforeseen requirement. Today, companies are exposed to much greater risk, so they, they require some reserve borrowing power, which gives them flexibility. Contain total risk. Total risk is the sum of financial risk and business risk. Make sure that your degree of total leverage is not very high. If your degree of operating leverage is high, you must ensure that your degree of financial leverage is low. 
try to enhance return on equity by employing source of finance, which have a lower post tax cost of capital, uh, minimize dilution of control. This is very important for many business families in India. They don't want to dilute their control and finance proactively because opportunities in the financial world may not coincide with opportunities in the investment world. If I look at a company in India which has deployed a very innovative financing strategy right from the very beginning, my example would be Reliance. I've had an opportunity of looking at Reliance on several occasions in the last uh, almost uh, 40 years, you know, when Dhirubhai Ambani went public in late 1970s, he realized that uh, he had to rely heavily on uh, the support of small investors because he did not ac have easy access to a uh, conventional source of banking and institutional finance. So he cultivated individual investors. I'll come to that in a moment. But these are some of the planks of their financing strategy, which has served them very well. Uh, think back. Right from the beginning, Reliance has always uh, thought of creating plans which are globally competitive. They always felt that their plans should be cost efficient and globally competitive. Let me give you one example. When Reliance uh, Petroleum Project was being conceived, when they wanted to set up a refinery in Jamnagar, the initial project size was 9 million. As the project formulation progressed, they increased it to 9, 12, 18, 24, and finally they went up to 33 million tons. I have seen that because I was doing some work for Reliance at that time, and I realized that they were not shy of taking up a refinery project of 33 million tons, which is the largest grassroots refinery in the world and perhaps the most cost-efficient grassroots refinery in the world. So Reliance is never shy. You know, they've invested uh, close to two lakh crores in their telecommunication venture, a lot of money in their uh, retail venture. And I often say, look at this surname, Ambani. Ambani is a combination of two words ambition and money. So they are never shy of a project of any size. Dedicate a team to treasury management. They brought in Alok Agarwal from Bank of America and set up a treasury team. We developed a very steady relationship with its merchant bankers. Initially, Merrill Lynch were their merchant bankers. And they started a very innovative practice, which I found the first of its kind among companies that have uh, examined in India and abroad, when a company goes to capital market, it has to prepare a lot of material. It takes several weeks or months to prepare the offer document. Companies make infrequent trips to the capital market, so they spend a few months to prepare the offer document. Reliance realized that Opportunities in the capital market change very dynamically over a period of time. So they instituted a practice of preparing the offer, offer document on a weekly basis. This is the innovative practice they introduced uh, so that they were in a position to tap an opportunity in the capital market wherever it arose. No wonder Reliance has been the first to tap various sources of finance, the first company from India to make a GDR issue, first company, Euro convertible bond, the first company from India to issue bonds in the American debt market, bonds issued by foreign companies in the US debt market are called Yankee bonds. Initially, they issued Yankee bonds, which had a maturity of 10 years. Then they went for bonds, which had a maturity of 25 years. And finally, they issued Yankee bonds, which had a maturity of 100 years, the first company from Asia Pacific region to issue bonds of that maturity. How could they do it? They could do it because they were in a state of perennial readiness to tap a transient opportunity in the capital market. They're dealing, financing, and investing, which means they 
finance proactively, not reactively. They always thought in international terms, whenever I spoke to them, they always talked in the language of US dollar, ensure that primary market investors earn. This was a kind of informal assurance given by Dhirubhai Ambani way back in 1978. He said, no investor who invests in a primary issue of reliance would have any reason to regret. So he has honored those promises during his life. Mukesh has also done, but the younger son forgot this assurance that the father used to give to the investor. Uh, talk to institutional investors as they realize that institutional investors have become important. They have started a very meaningful dialogue. And they did leverage in a very timely manner. And there was concern about excessive leverage in 2018, 2019. They decided to deleverage systematically. And uh, last year, they become a net uh, zero debt company. Uh, this is what Alok Agarwal, CFO of Reliance, says financing decisions are guided by factors like market uh, like uh, market capitalization, EPS, return on equity, debt equity ratio, and interest cover. What are the key considerations formulating the dividend policy? Uh, uh, investment decisions have the greatest impact on value creation. External equity is more expensive than internal equity. Most promoters are averse to dilute their stake. There is a limit to debt financing. And dividend decisions have an important significant value. I participate in dividend decision making in a number of companies over a period of time. And these are guidelines that have served me very well uh, in my uh, participation of dividend discussion. Don't pay dividends at the expense of positive NPV projects. Minimize the need to sell external equity. Define a target dividend payout ratio Along with the target debt equity ratio, accept temporary departures, avoid dividend cuts, and issue bonus shares periodically. Formulating a dividend policy involves looking at a number of factors in a very, very innovative way in order to ensure that your dividend decision serves as a very useful signal about your future prospects at the same time it provides adequate support to all value enhancing investments. Uh, here is a statement of dividend policy of Infosys. Uh, uh, in April uh, 2017, they decided to change the dividend policy and pay up to 70% of free cash flow. Uh, net cash provided by operating activities, let, less capital expenditure. Now you see, these notions or ideas have become standard in corporate financial discussion, free cash flow. The earlier dividend policy was to distribute up to 50% of post-tax profits. And I found an identical shift in policy in TCS. They talk in terms of distributing 80% of their free cash flow. How come, hello, oh, sorry, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, there was some uh, uh, PPT that I uh, just wanted to test. So let me skip it. A well-designed uh, 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 performance management system mitigates agency costs. To my mind, one of the greatest challenges that companies are facing all over the world is a challenge to design a performance management system. Imagine the challenges faced by a company like TCS, which may have more than five lakh employees working in 93 geographies. How do you manage the performance of lakhs of people in such a manner that they are focused on value creation? Performance management, has become, to my mind, the greatest challenge for most of companies in India and abroad. Uh, performance management is concerned with three issues. How do you delegate authority to different levels in the organization? 
what are the measures of performance you employ to measure the performance of executives at various levels? What is the system of reward and penalties that you follow? Uh, every organization that I have come across is not satisfied with its performance management system. Some are fairly satisfied, but most of them uh, say that their performance management system is work in progress because of the complexity of the task involved. Let me give you a very interesting example uh, uh, from the US. This is way back in the uh, 20th century, maybe in 1930, 1940, when Alfred Sloan was the CEO of General Motors. By the way, General Motors was the most profitable corporation on this planet, not for 10 years, not for 20 years, but for over 45 years. People don't realize, but General Motors was the largest, most profitable, and the most valuable company on the planet. And uh, uh, Alfred Stone presided over the destiny of General Motors for several decades, and he instituted divisionalization. To my mind, divisionalization represents a very important organizational innovation, which emanated in General Motors. For the first time, they said, a large organization like this will have to be broken down into various divisions, and they created Buick Division, Cadillac Division, Pontiac Division, so on and so forth. And each division was treated as an investment center. The head of the division could make investment decisions, asking the corporate treasury to provide funds. And uh, Alfred Sloan instituted a very simple rule. He said, you can ask $100 million from the corporate head office, provided you earn a return on investment of 20% within a period of two years. If you did not earn 20% in two years, you would be summarily sacked. This was an extreme example, but uh, this shows how Jan Motors organized itself and became very, very uh, effective and profitable. HUL, among Indian companies that I have studied, has perhaps one of the best performance management systems. It's a company with a high degree of decentralization empowerment, and they have differentiated pay for performance. Uh, and they have learning and development plans for executives at every level, and they have 360 day degrees feedback. Now, these are some examples that I encountered in my interactions with corporate world in India. HUL, another company which I greatly admire for its performance management system is TCS. TCS has a distributed leadership model and which empowers people. They have built a group of 40 to 50 leaders for the willingness to scale up their operations. And this is one of the factors for the tremendous success of TCS over a period of time. Companies use a variety of financial measures, a variety of non-financial measures to measure the performance of employees at various levels. I'm sure most of these are covered in some course or the other. And companies have started using the balance scorecard. They look at performance from various angles. There is a hierarchy of value metrics, as I see. The basic value drivers are market share, cost per unit, R&D uh, projects, employee productivity, financial determinants are ROIC, growth, cost of capital, invested capital, intrinsic value is value of discounted cash flow, and option value, and then you have stock market performance measured in terms of total shareholder return and market value added. I can go on on time. Here is a very fascinating book for those who want to know how organization can be designed to pay it value. A dominant uh, corporate restructuring has become a dominant global business team. <laughs> Look at any company today and they're talking of mergers, acquisitions, or dives in some way or the other. And last year we did a record MA transaction in this country, and this will accelerate in future. This has become the dominant global business theme. Uh, unfortunately, 
Some empirical studies suggest that many of these acquisitions erode value. The earlier figure was 60 to 70, more recent figures show about 50%. And the main reason for value destruction is uh, what I call the winner's curse phenomenon. Let us look at a situation like this. Here is a target company, P, and there are three potential acquirers, A, B, and C. A bids 100, B bids 150, C bids 200. C emerges as a bidder, but C is often a cursed winner because C overpays out of ignorance or infatuation or a deadly combination of the two. The most conspicuous example of this is uh, the acquisition of Corus. In an interview given to Christian Tan of CNBC, Ratan Tata said that they looked at Corus initially and uh, found that it had a market capital of 5.5 to $6 billion. I'm aware of this transaction because at that time I was doing a uh, finance group for Tata Finance Professionals and they said we have done our internal valuation at $6 billion. We uh, made an initial bid of $7.6 billion, which was accepted by the chorus board. But CSN of Brazil entered the fray and under the UK takeover court, competitive bidding has to be done. And in that process, Tata Steel ended up paying $13 billion and Ratan Tata admitted he was stubborn and unwilling to go. This is a very conspicuous example of the winner's curse phenomenon. A company which has managed very well its, its acquisitions is called its Consumer Product Limited. I won't have time. And Berkshire Hathaway. In the VUCA world that we live in, risk management is critical for survival and growth. We live in a world which is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Thanks to rapid globalization, interdependence of financial markets, shifts in economic power, pressure on natural resources, swings in currencies, material costs, equity prices, and climate change. Uh, companies recognize various kinds of risk. You have financial risk, operational risk, compliance related risk, strategic risk, environmental risk. Financial risk can be managed fairly well with the use of financial derivatives. Operational risk can be managed by using standard operating procedures. Compliance related risk can be managed by using standard operating procedures. But it's very difficult to manage strategic risk and it is even more difficult to manage environmental risk as pandemic has shown how vulnerable companies are. But companies have been doing a lot in this area. <laughs> this is one area where I find that corporate India has uh, become far more aware of the dangers or that they encounter now. And a lot of emphasis has been put on corporate risk management. There are two areas where a lot of emphasis has been put in uh, recent years. Uh, corporate risk management and corporate governance, but we have a long way to go. Uh, as far as financial risks are concerned, forwards, futures, swaps, and options are used widely. The most popular tools are forward swaps option. Uh, choice of forwards and swaps over futures and options uh, is commonly found in various companies I uh, studied, and there is a preference for risk hedging for the banking system rather than the capital market. And when you use forwards and swaps rather than futures and options, there is greater scope for customization. As I said, COVID-19 underlined the importance of building resilience, building a resilient uh, business requires a new mindset according to BCG. Instead of focusing exclusively on maximizing efficiency, uh, resilience involves building new capabilities that may come at a short notice. And instead of managing short-term shifts in performance, it requires a focus on long-term value creation and a balancing of uh, running uh, of efficiency and long-term effectiveness. 
Uh, the last reflection is corporate governance does matter. Uh, corporate governance is concerned with the principal agency relationship that we find any business. You have shareholders who appoint board of directors, the board of directors appoint top management, top management in turn appoints lower level management, so on and so forth. And uh, uh, thanks to a number of scandals that the world has seen, Corporate governance has become a very important theme and finance professionals have a special role to enhance the quality of corporate governance. Based on my experience, I find that these are the five best practices of corporate governance. One, build a strong qualified board of directors and evaluate performance. Two, define roles and responsibilities. Three, emphasize integrity and ethical decisions. Four, evaluate performance and make principal compensation decisions. Five, engage in uh, effective risk management. Uh, a lot of reports have come out on corporate governance. I was uh, designing a small program on corporate governance for IM Bangalore. And we found that there were over 30 reports of corporate governance that have been put out by various agencies internationally. Uh, uh, and uh, at least the government of India feels that the kind of soul searching that has happened in recent years, particularly in the wake of the introduction of the Companies Act 2013, uh, there has been some improvement. This is what Ijit Srinivas, Corporate Affairs Secretary told me, at a very broad level, enforcement actions have generated a lot of soul searching and there appears to be perceptible change in behavior for the good. There's a lot of introspection at board level committee level and statutory auditor level. The consciousness has definitely increased. This is a very welcome thing and I expect it to become even more pronounced in the years to come. In a very interesting book called Winning Investors Over, Baruch Klaib, an eminent uh, accounting scholar, say shareholders really want three things the pursuit of long-term corporate growth, sharing of relevant and truthful information, and avoidance of misconduct and embarrassment by the company and its manager. The best example of corporate governance to my mind is Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, Warren Buffett has prepared what is called the Owner's Manual of Berkshire Hathaway. It runs to a few pages. It has 13 to 14 principles. I've examined so many documents and reports in corporate governance. The best document or report or guide on corporate governance is the Owner's Manual that is found in every annual report of Berkshire Hathaway. Every student of management ought to read that owner's manual. Essentially, he emphasizes these things. We will focus on long-term value creation. We'll share relevant and truthful information and we will avoid misconduct. We will ensure that there is no conflict of interest between us, the major shareholders and others who have minority stake. And the owner's manual that you find in the annual report was not prepared now, not prepared 10 years ago, not prepared 20 years ago. It was prepared way back in late 1970s, which is an indication of how far-sighted and enlightened Mr. Warren Buffett is. I had an opportunity of interviewing him. That is uh, a very interesting uh, uh, topic for conversation at some other time, but uh, he said, uh, this is what I told my shareholders in 
or 67 when he had acquired controlling interest of Berkshire Hathaway at the AGM, he made a very succinct statement to his minority shareholders. He said, we want to grow rich with you, not of you. This statement summarizes very crisply, succinctly, and powerfully the essence of corporate governance. We want to grow rich with you, not of you. As an illustration, he said, if the market price of Berkshire Hathaway increases from $18 to $36, your gain is 100%, my gain is 100%. Of course, the scale may be different, but percentages will be identical. And he has followed that maxim so faithfully in the last so many years of his stewardship. Today, market price per share of Berkshire Hathaway may be $250,000 or whatever. And uh, he has ensured that there is no conflict of interest between minority shareholders and Warren Buffett and his associates. Uh, there is a very fascinating book called Corporate Governance Matters by David Larkar and Brian Tyan. All students of management ought to understand the importance of corporate governance as it is a very, very important issue. Uh, ultimately, value creation over a period of time or value enhancement over a period of time would mean the following return on invested capital should be greater than weight and average cost of capital. You have to create competitive advantage through innovation to satisfy this condition in a highly competitive world. Return on invested capital is greater than weight and average cost of capital for many years. This is possible only when you create entry barriers, have a powerful brand and invest adequately in intellectual property and intangible assets, reinvestment for profit is made in order to assure growth and growth can be achieved by way of expansions, both organic and inorganic in adjacent areas. Uh, uh, the seven mantras are a core priority to value creation, build sustainable, competitive advantage, allocate capital rationally, lower weight and average cost of capital while preserving financial flexibility for the performance-oriented culture, manage risk in an integrated manner, and build a relationship of trust with all stakeholders. I call it as the seven mantras, and I give it to every uh, CEO or every corporate director I come across, and that is the way going forward. Uh, uh, all these are based on my book, Financial Management Year in Practice, for those who want to look at these things in greater detail. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Satish, I am done. It's at 5.35, so I had to skip a lot of things to adhere to your timeline. Now I have about 15 minutes to take questions. Is that fine? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, sir. We will uh, take in questions. I think uh, Professor Satish Kumar and uh, you know Professor Raghunath <coughs> will uh, will share the questions. Uh, Professor Satish. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you so much for such a uh, nice interaction and I mean en enlightening us in terms of uh, financial areas. No matter how hard and deep study, but the kind of insights you get by listening somebody like you. Examine I mean, altogether a different experience. So, uh, so there is a question from one of the students. <clears throat> They're asking, what's your opinion on the corporate bond market structure in India, sir? Mm -hmm. What is your opinion on the corporate bond market structure in India? You know, uh, we have to develop the corporate bond market much more. If you look at other countries, the primary source of long-term finance is the corporate bond market. In India, traditionally, that has been neglected because we relied heavily on institutional finance. To my mind, government has to take very 
innovative steps to promote corporate bond market. If you look at the Indian financial system, bulk of the savings are appropriated by the government in some form or the other, which has virtually crowded out the corporate sector. Now there is some increase in the size of corporate bond market. A lot more has to happen in that space. Uh, I'm sure they require an entire session to discuss various things that need to be done, but corporate bond market has been neglected. And if you look at infrastructure financing globally, it is done largely by way of bonds. And we have to make trillions of dollars of investment in that sector. We need to develop corporate bond market. Initial steps have been taken, but a lot more needs to be done. Uh, thank you. Good, thank you, sir. Yes. Uh, good evening, Dr. Chandra. My name is Raghunath Koya. Uh, mm -hmm. One, yeah. Uh, one of the participants is asking uh, whether after the IBC Act of 2016, uh, the companies would opt for the market finance or institutional finance. What would be, be what would be the scenario in the light of this IBC Act, sir? What are what are your thoughts? To my mind, the major benefit of the IBC Act is that it has instituted a good credit culture in India. Now, companies are very careful about borrowing, whether they borrow from financial institutions or banks or whether they raise money in the debt market because any lender who is not uh, uh, dealt with properly can go to IBC now. To my mind, that has been the most salutary effect of IBC, and you can see that, you know, corporates have deleveraged themselves and they are very cautious. The kind of reckless investments that we saw in 2008, 2009, 2010, thanks to all kinds of things, to my mind, are probably a matter of history, and IBC has instilled a sense of discipline whether you are borrowing from a bank or raising money in the bond market. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, sir, uh, one more question from the participants. Why is finance majorly concerned with cash flows but not with earnings? <laughs> As they say, uh, revenue is uh, vanity. <laughs> Earnings are sanity and cash is reality. <laughs> you know, please understand only cash matters, nothing else matters. Yeah. As, sir, another participant is wondering whether the investors would be giving more weightage to the potential market potential of the company or would they be weighing more to the ethics? aspects of the company's governance, sir. You know, uh, as I say, now investors are becoming smarter. Of course, you always have some uh, stupid investors, some irrational investors. You, know, you always have some small bubbles in the market all the time. But if I look at long-term institutional investors, they are focusing on growth, profitability, and governance. You know, they are concerned with everything. Yeah. And that is the reason why companies which are perceived to be dubious in their corporate governance are given a very, very low valuation in the capital market. Thank you, sir. sir uh, one of the part uh, participants is willing to know, what is your opinion on the determinants of the corporate yield curve? Corporate? Corporate yield curve. Uh -huh. What's your opinion on the determinants of the corporate yield curve? Uh, you, you, yield curve is essentially a function of uh, inflation rate, risk premium, and time. Is it? Yes, yes, sir. Sir, uh, yeah. Yeah. Sir, uh, the, I mean, uh, it's a question from one of our colleagues. He wants to know, with uncertainty increasing, how can valuation process discount the same better? 
<laughs> now one thing is absolutely clear you need to work with a range of value you have to value a company under different scenarios one thing is absolutely clear scenario modeling and scenario valuation will become the norm going forward you can't say value of the company is uh, 100 crore rupees you'll have to say it is somewhere between 60 crore and 120 crore or whatever you have to create valuation models under different scenarios people are now thinking more probabilistically that was not the case 5 10 15 years now i find that uh, scenario building has become very common in the world of professional finance particularly after covid 19 when i talk to some of the cfos they say we have learned about scenario building from you earlier but we never gave any serious attention to it today we have realized the importance of scenario building and the greatest advantage is that when you start constructing scenarios you have a lot of input and uh, de debate and discussion and one of the things that i am noticing and which is a very welcome thing is uh, companies are becoming far more uh, decentralized in their decision making in many of these areas that one participant is wondering that yesterday government of india or vodafone converted government the dues to the government of india into the equity mm -hmm. uh, uh, is it salutary is it desirable or is it a, a nice way of getting out of a tight situation you know uh, look at it from the point of view of uh, uh, aditya billa group you know kumar mangalam billa said earlier also that he is willing to give his entire stake freely to government or any other entity. You know, they realized that uh, it had very little economic value and they did not have the financial capacity to nurture the company. If you look at the communication of Kumar Mangalam Billa to government of India, he said very clearly, I want this entity to survive because there are 27 crore uh, people who are using our services and I'm willing to give it away freely. Now, this uh, is one way by which right. government will acquire stake and we hope that government will do something to ensure that the entity is alive. In the interest of competition, it is desirable that we have at least three major players in the telecommunication sector. Now, if I look at it from the point of view of the Aditya Billa group, they are essentially saying we don't mind the losses that we have incurred in the past. We might have spent 30, 40,000 crore and that is money down the drain. We want this company to remain in existence. Let the government do whatever it wants to in order to save it. Now it is up to the government to do whatever it wants to. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, one more question. Uh, uh, the participant is saying one of the ways to absorb the re default risk is to increase the interest rate with risk premium. Mm -hmm. so they are wondering, then how does it take care of the loss of the principal? Is the collateral the only way? Come again. Sorry, I'm... Uh, uh, sir, I say traditionally increasing the interest rate risk with the risk premium is to one of the ways to absorb the default risk. Uh -huh. But then how do you take care of the loss of the principal? Now, when you are saying that you are raising the interest rate because you perceive the debt instrument to be more risky, you are assuming that some debt will default. You can't have... Uh, a default free situation when you are, you know, instead of asking for 8%, if you are asking for 12%, obviously you are saying that if I have a portfolio which has a YTM of 12%, it is likely that a portion of the portfolio may turn out to be a non performing asset. That's part of the game. You know, this is what I want to emphasize. We need to have proper pricing mechanism for risk in this country. Uh, one of the major limitations or weaknesses of the Indian financial system is that risk has not been priced 
properly. That is why you find that the yield curve goes all over the places. And this is partly because of financial repression. I am hoping that in the next 10 years, we'll have more market determined rates and a fairer assessment of risk and a, a risk return equation, which is comparable to what you find in the developed world. Uh, sir, one participant is wondering, in view of the observation that there is a good amount of soul searching in the boardrooms, mm -hmm. can we now say that uh, corporate uh, governance practices are now much more healthier than what they were, let us say, 10, 15, 20 years back, sir? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, you know, this is my personal observation. I have also been in corporate boards and uh, over a period of time. And this is a long drawn process. Of course, you'll have some uh, corporates which uh, give uh, only lip service. You know, they still uh, prepare a corporate governance report as if you were to tick boxes. But there is a healthy change, you know, which I personally see. And many of them have realized that you get a much higher multiple when you are perceived as a well-run, well-governed company. You can see that very obviously, you know, if you look at some of the Tata companies, their profitability is pathetic, but they enjoy good valuation because of perceived good quality corporate governance. And this is now being realized. And fortunately, you know, private equity and venture capital have played a very important role in the last 10, 15 years in promoting new companies in India. And they do emphasize the importance of corporate governance. So you have a role being played by a private equity and venture capital fund and a role being played by the regulator and a role being played by institutional investors. It is a long drawn process. You can't reform corporate governance. You'll always have uh, companies which are misgoverned, but uh, there is a clear realization. As I said, enlightened value maximization is now being considered as the right path by the leading companies in the country. And I look at it like this. If you look at the total market capitalization companies on uh, uh, Bombay Stock Exchange, and you find that the companies which I call as companies which pursue enlightened value maximization principle account for the bulk of it. And that is where we can take comfort. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, one more candidate is asking about how Fed policy and tapering can impact the capital market and money market? Uh, I don't think it will have a very significant impact. You know, uh, if you look at uh, the interest rate uh, movement in the US, for example, between 2003, 2005, 2006, you know, Fed raised, raised the interest rate several times, but it did not have much impact on the Indian market. And uh, uh, if you look at last year, you know, the bulk of the money has come by way of foreign direct investment uh, and uh, investment by way of, you know, venture capital and private equity. That is not very sensitive to interest rate movements. So, yes, it will have an effect, but I think the effect has been somewhat exaggerated. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, we'll take one last question. Uh, Raghunath, sir. Yeah, Dr. Satish, uh, can I ask? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, sir, uh, in fact, you know, it is always believed that uh, markets, uh, in the markets, the capital alloc allocation process is pretty efficient. But I'm just wondering the way the Paytm issue has been priced and the mm -hmm. way it has been lapped up by the investors. Mm -hmm. uh, probably, sir, can we call it a misallocation of the capital? I'm just wondering, it's my own thoughts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, let me tell you, markets are efficient most of the time, but tend to become ineff inefficient. And there are certain pockets of market which tend to be more inefficient than others. Today, there is this uh, mania for digitization. You know, I see there is a mania, and in the wake of such a mania, you are likely to find euphoric valuations. You know, I 
see some parallel between this mania and the dot com bubble okay uh, it's very difficult to find exact parallel but invariably what happens uh, in the large financial uh, market system that we have you always have some pockets where there is a lot of euphoria where small bubbles are being created for example there is a bubble in the gaming segment there is a bubble in the cryptocurrency segment it doesn't mean that the entire market is highly inefficient there is a bubble in the digital uh, company section you know kind of thing so uh, yeah, yeah to put it very uh, broadly you know maybe the number of companies which uh, are a, appearing in the capital market today by way of ipo uh if you look at the overall performance of investors who participate in ipo over a period of 10 years overall performance may be less than satisfactory you will have some companies which will do well but if you look at the overall performance this is my best guess as of now thank you sir yes sir uh, uh, i hope am i audible professor satish yes yes sir yeah yeah yeah, so thank you very much, sir, for this wonderful uh, lecture. You know, it, it, it spanned your entire experience and it was great to, you know, hear. Uh, we thank you from, uh, you know, from our faculty members, our uh, students. I hope that, you know, they understand the importance of value drivers, the importance of how finance has evolved and what was important earlier and what is important in the current, uh, current context. And also your insider information from your consulting and, you know, various roles uh, being the board members and you know <clears throat> on the advisory boards and things like that it was really uh, nice and as always you know listening to you i'd also like to thank uh, our vice chancellor uh, professor mahinder reddy uh, our dean uh, professor sarijan uh, and now professor ved who's our advisor uh, and uh, the management who had uh, approved uh, you know for this uh, great lecture i'd also like to thank uh, the professors of finance uh, my colleagues who are here uh, and the students uh, for being there i'm sure that you know they have all gained you know uh, a lot during this particular uh, thing i also like to thank uh, you know professor kirti and sorry uh, kirti and uh, professor nasimachari for you know helping us with this uh, you know this entire digitizing process or whatever we call in terms of zoom platform and recording and things like that thank you very much sir uh, you know it's been a wonderful wonderful lecture till we get back again you know, th thank you, sir. I'll get back to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for all of you for your patient hearing. I enjoyed interacting with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you so much, sir.